Hi there, everyone. We are so happy to have you, whether you are joining us here today or watching later from the Cure Gaba A YouTube channel. We ask that you please mute your mics if you have not done so already and include any questions that you might have in the chat box below. We'll have time to answer the questions at the end of the presentation. My name is Monica Joanna Elnakabe, and I'm the founder and CEO of Cure Gaba A, a nonprofit organization with the sole focus to develop potential therapies for GABA A variants. By partnering with world renowned researchers in GABA A and the Organization of Patients for Clinical Trials. Today, we welcome Brad Levy, who recently invited Cure GABA A to exhibit at his expo and conference at Disney. In 2005, Brad had no prior medical experience until his daughter's sudden onset seizures an epilepsy diagnosis. He founded the Epilepsy Awareness Day at Disneyland, which has grown into a significant annual event. This past year's event expected a participation of around 100 epilepsy support groups and 2,000 individuals. Cure Gaba A was one of them. Driven by his passion for autism community, Brad took on the challenge of creating an ideal EEG equipment and protocol in collaboration with Lifelines Neurodiagnostics and Dr. David Millet in 2015. He actively seeks out well-trained epilepsy specialists to enhance their referral network and speaking roster at the EAD Expo. Today, Brad's service offers patients an alternative to hospitals and inpatient EEG service, focusing on comfort and data collection efficiency. I'm handing it off to you. Please explain to us the importance of an overnight EEG monitor and tracking genetic epilepsy and assessing the efficacy of treatment. Well, thank you for that introduction. I am Brad Levy. I, I did, am the founder of eeg to go uh, We do in-home video EEG monitoring, as Monica was explaining, um, with the sole purpose of really trying to keep healthy patients out of the hospital. We're now running four offices across the country. We are looking to open up a few more locations. Okay. So aside from these cute kids on our front page, um, it's got the office, the addresses of our four offices across the country. Um, we are members of ASSET, which is the, the governing body of EEG and neurodiagnostics. We're also a member of the Epilepsy Ameri American Epilepsy Society, which is, for the most part, the governing body over all of our epileptologists and neurophysiologists. Um, I'm going to use that word epileptologist several times through this talk. So just to catch everybody up, for those of you who are unaware, um, a neurologist is clearly a well-rounded physician, you know, educated in treating brain conditions. They have some training in epilepsy, of course, traumatic brain injury, concussion, movement disorders, sleep issues, a multitude of neurological conditions, but they don't have any subspecialty training in any of those. Once you decide you are going to take the path and treat epilepsy, we prefer to work with doctors who become epileptologists. So once they are a neurologist, they then take another two or three year fellowship program to become a boarded epileptologist neurophysiologist with emphasis on specifically comorbidities, learning how to manage the pharmacology with multiple medications, all anti-seizure meds, um, and of course, uh, an extensive training on reading EEG. So um, we also have the logo here on the bottom right corner of my slide deck. That is for Epilepsy Awareness Day, which was the event Monica was talking about. We're going for 6,000 guests this year, um, and the event will be November 18 and 19 at the Disneyland Hotel this year. Uh, and on the 20th is the day at Disneyland. Um, we'll talk more about that in a, later on when I, I've got some more slides to show you. Let's get started on what is EEG monitoring. Well, before I go to that, I'm sorry. Let me give you a quick about me. Um, this is my brief story. My daughter had uh, suffered from seizures for five years. This is about 20 years ago. Um, and we, we struggled to find a diagnosis. We had doctors contradicting each other. 
everybody thought he knew more than the last doctor, several failed medications, um, and not really much hope with seizures in our family every day. So we finally were fortunate enough to meet the team at UCLA who figured out that Sophie had a small lesion in her left temporal region. And without epilepsy surgery, there was no medication that was going to stop her seizures. So with one and only choice, uh, epilepsy surgery, we then traveled the country interviewing epilepsy surgeons and ended up back at UCLA where we started um, after meeting many of the, the country's top doctors. And they all advised that we already had the best back here in Los Angeles with Dr. Gary Mathern. Uh, Speed ahead, Dr. Mathern did the surgery 15 years ago. From the minute they started the surgery, the EEG corrected, and it appeared that she was now seizure-free. And we are about to celebrate Sophie's 15 years of seizure freedom on February 27th this, this month. This is the about us on my medical director, Dr. David Millette. He uh, has some extensive training and has read over 6,000 pediatric EEGs for us over the, the last 12 years. Uh, Dr. Millette is not a pediatric treating doctor. He is actually the medical director at Hogue Hospital, which is an adult epilepsy center, um, but he has specialized training in reading both adults and kids and is one of the, the top epilepsy readers I, that I've met. And, and I know several doctors uh, across the country, but Dr. Millette is a rare breed. Um, and he is known for his um, extensive understanding of reading specifically kids with autism, underlying autism diagnosis, and now the new diagnosis of epilepsy or seizures. Um, it's a little tricky. There are a lot of nuances to that. Um, but he happens to be very good at it. And we are making great strides in, in getting and breaking into the autism community and getting these kids diagnosed um, with this absence seizure condition that they have that's for the most part been ignored by most medical centers. Okay. So yes, kids are cute. And that's what they look like after they've got an EEG on. Um, it is not the most fun 24 to 72 hours that you will spend with your child, but the data collection is amazing and the results are often used to really change the course of, of your, your treatment and, and the child's life. So we're very proud of what we do. Um, we're very proud of what we do and we, we think we're very good at it. The question that we get most of the time when they're little toddlers and especially kids with that, you know, autism diagnosis, it's hard to keep kids still when they come in and not everybody will sit still on mom's lap in a barber chair um, and be compliant while we do the hookup. But we have solutions um, that we feel are more humane and definitely uh, less stressful on the child. So we use this swaddle method where we take a child's bed sheet and swaddle them up like a small burrito. And that keeps the hands and feet inside so we don't have any flailing and pulling on wires and interrupting the hookup. Um, but at the same time, we're also not hurting the child. We have never sedated a patient in 12 years. We use that neck pillow to steer the head and put it in the position that we needed to to finish the, the, the application. Um, and as you can see by the cute fellow in the third picture, you know, the crying stops and everybody seems to adjust to it once the head wrap is on. So what is EEG monitoring? You know, it's a sad thing, but in the United States, the standard of care for a patient following a seizure is a 40 to 60 minute EEG. That type of routine EEG basically dictates that the patient had to have um, just before that EEG, um, had to have had a seizure or have one while we are doing that 40 to 60 minute recording in order for us to capture that data. And that's just, you know, so rare that we ever find that and almost never in a child. It's just not a normal environment of, uh, that would, that would, that would resemble the environment that they were at when they had their seizure. Um, most kids don't have a seizure sitting in a bright medical office 
um, having electrodes placed on their heads. They have it when they have a, a compromised immune system or they're tired or other environmental effects that will, you know, allow for the seizure to creep up and, and occur, but it's generally not during a 40 minute EEG. So we are not big fans of routine EEG, which is the whole premise and reason we started EEG to go. Epileptologists um, almost always will order a 24 to a 72 hour EEG. There's uh, several reasons for it. Uh, I'll talk about it more in a moment when we get to the next slide. Um, but the longer the EEG, the more data we collect. Some doctors um, will actually leave an EEG hooked up until they see a clinical seizure, and then they have it recorded because nobody's looking forward to hooking your child up a second time in the, in the near future. We want to capture the data now while we have that chance and opportunity, and then you know recreate your and, and carve out your treatment plan after that. It takes us about an hour once you guys come into the office to get the child hooked up, start to finish, um, and we'll go through that in a, a couple of slides later. But it's basically an hour, um, and uh, when you leave, there is basically nothing to do except take your child home and keep them bibs all their favorite snacks, time, and lots of love and attention. And the 24 to 72 hours will pass soon enough. We, um, our EEGs record two sources of data. One, um, and I have the sample of our machine in that photo, that little tiny white box is the actual EEG recorder. Our electrodes plug into that box, and then we drop it in a small padded case and put it on the child inside of a kid's backpack uh, that we clip on, and then they're free to go home and run around the house and do most of their normal activity um, other than swim and take a shower. They've got to stay dry, but they can play, jump on the trampoline, you know, Lego, iPad, roll around with the siblings, whatever it is that they would normally do. They can even go out and take a ride in the car, do carpool, pick up the siblings, whatever it is. Um, we try not to interrupt their normal daily life as much as possible. And then that larger component there that you see with the solo name on it, that is the data collection system for the video. So basically you leave wearing this recorder that's capturing your brain scan, you know, the abnormal electrical activity coming off the brain. And then that second piece is basically a high performance baby monitor. And that sits in the home recording the child while they are playing, uh, doing floor time with mom or the other caregivers, um, watching TV, playing on an iPad, homework, anything that they would normally do when they are, you know, sitting or, or lying down and staying in one place, they would do that in front of the video monitor. And then at bedtime, you just move that monitor into the bedroom so we can capture the sleep on video as well. The child is not connected to that big device. It just sits across from the room, but it is connected via Bluetooth to the small recorder in the backpack so that when we get a brain scan, it's got the perfect time code running across the bottom, and that same time code is running across the bottom of the video so that the doctor can then verify what was the child doing at the time that I saw that abnormal activity. Did we find something during sleep? Was it jumping on the trampoline? Or was the child just banging on his head like a small drum, which would cause artifact and, and give the doctor an incorrect reading? Um, but the video clears that up for us anytime we have any, any type of a, a supposition that something may have gone wrong or may just be artifact or, or, or not true data. That's what the video's for. It, it basically confirms um, confirms our suspicions. We do have a monitoring tech on call for the whole time that you guys are out. The monitoring tech is required to um, go on via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi and view that EEG recorder while it's on the patient in the home. We do not read the EEG during the recording. None of us are physicians or for sure not epileptologists who read EEG, but we're just verifying that the data is being collected properly, it's recording properly, and that the patient is getting a significant time on video. Um, but we do monitor it for a few moments every two hours, all through your recording period. And... Um, and we are there for technical support in case anything should go wrong. If you have questions, if there's an emergency and your doctor needs to be contacted, we do have somebody on call the entire time. 
And once we're done, uh, depending on who referred you to EEG to go, we can either get your doctor a report from our epileptologist, or we have a um, very high end reading software known as Persist, and we home that on our uh, cloud server in our California office so that we can invite your physician onto our cloud service and they can read your EEG for themselves, uh, actually see the raw data and the video through our cloud. So your doctor needs nothing other than a Google browser um, to access our cloud and, and use our reading software to read your EEG. Hey, why do we do these long-term EEGs? Why do we do the monitoring as opposed to that 40 to 60, 60 minute EEG that many of your doctors have told you was sufficient? So, um, you know, doctors, especially epileptologists will tell you that in the pediatric world, we want to see every aspect of that child's routine. So that means we wanna get you hooked up early in the morning, have you return home, and we want the child to have a busy brain and a calm body as much as possible. Within reason, we're not expecting kids to sit still for three days, but we do need some calm, calm time mixed in during during the you know the the course of the day. Um, we would like some relaxed time, some agitated time where they have a little raised level of stress. Sometimes that comes with homework in older kids. Um, with the toddlers, it could be as easy as taking away the iPad in the middle of a cartoon. So we would like to kind of have some uh, interruption of tasks, some relaxed calm time, some agitated time, um, and try to get them to do as many of their normal daily tasks as possible. So if you have kids that like to read or listen to mom or dad read, we encourage that. Legos are always great. Any types of games or puzzles that are non-electronic, that's always some good, some good, uh, that brings us good data. And then of course, iPad TV, we're always gonna have some electronic stimulation as well. And then very important is the winding down time. We need to see your child's brain while it's getting tired throughout the day, then getting drowsy as it gets closer to bedtime, falling asleep, and sleeping, or as I say, doing whatever it is your child calls sleep while you're trying to sleep, because many of our kids don't really get quality sleep or sleep at all. So we would need all of that, um, as well as those kids who have nighttime awakening and, and don't sleep well, and you tuck them in, they look like a beautiful little angel when you leave the room, and then when you come back to check on them, the covers have been kicked off, the pajamas are off, and, and the kid's you know sleeping in the bed and has reversed his head is at the feet and his feet are on the pillow, and this is not good sleep. Even if the child's eyes are closed and he's snoring, this is still not good sleep. And we are most likely going to find some abnormal brain activity with that much restlessness. Um, and then we need you to wake up and start your day and kind of get your cobwebs out until the child is, you know, really, you know, functioning again that following morning. And all of that would constitute a 24-hour EEG. And we pretty much need all of that data in order to really assess what your kid's doing on a normal 24-hour period. That's really the premise for doing long-term monitoring is that all of that activity needs to be captured in order to make a quality assessment. Um, another reason, uh, other than screening you know, the brain, is we check for the efficacy of your meds. Um, often doctors are trying something new, whether he's added a new medication and creating a cocktail for your child, or he's using a medication maybe off label, um, or even in a clinical trial that we're not sure what the outcome is going to be. That's what the EEG is there for. Uh, we may not see, visually see clinical change in the patient. We don't see a lot of the seizures if they're absence or small partial seizures. You don't always see them with the eye. So the only way we know if the brain is improving is to run an EEG, both baseline 
prior to starting the new treatment. And then, you know, intermittently as that treatment is progressing, that's how doctors track and see if what they think is working is actually working. And it will help them to, to kind of, you know, make a detour on that path if they need to, whether it's changing the dose or discontinuing or adding a new med. And then of course, we're always looking for improvement or decline on the brain function. Um, you know, we have many kids with genetic epilepsies that are doing two EEGs a year. And they want to say, I've been following this patient for seven years. I've got 14 EEGs on record. I have no variables in my data collection because I've used the same EEG service who uses the same machine, who uses the same process, who uses the same technologist and uses the same epileptologist to read all 14 of those EEGs. So the only variable and change in that data is going to be caused by the treatment. And that's how we can track to see what medications may be working again and to see if, you know, that brain is actually recovering or are, are we slipping. That final, that final statement on there is what we see more often than not is um, patients coming in again, you know, with an autism diagnosis and unsure of any seizure activity, but their doctor has told them that there are very subtle symptoms such as little short blank stares on their face, eyes with a little small twitching of the eyes or a little bit of blinking, um, small jerking of the foot or the hand during sleep as they're falling asleep. <clears throat> and these symptoms don't really scream out to the mom or dad, hey, that's a seizure. Um, so they kind of go undetected until the doctor says, you know, there may be things going on that we don't see with our naked eye. Let's get an EEG and really get a good look. And that's when we often find this absence seizure activity. Um, and we prefer doctors who will aggressively go after and try to treat that seizure after it's too late. Okay. How does it work? So, um, we do have four offices now. We are in Irvine, California, Phoenix, Arizona, Frisco, Texas, which is just north of Dallas, and Melbourne, Florida, which is very close to Orlando. It takes about an hour to get you guys set up. Um, all of the products are hypoallergenic, water-soluble, and easy to use and to remove. Um, anybody who has done an EEG in the hospital has most likely had... Um, an ugly product called collodion, um, which has a horrible odor. It requires a an air dryer to 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 uh, harden and dry that paste once it's been applied. And getting it off is miserable. It takes chunks of hair. Uh, it can leave some bald spots. It's not it's not a lovely uh, a lovely process anymore. It's a bit outdated. Um, and fortunately for us. You know, we figured out about 10 years ago that we had an easier way to do this and it's been working excellent. Um, we have had allergists run all of our product um, out of the 12 products that we use. We had one tape that was found to have some latex. That tape is no longer inside our facilities. Um, and now everything is latex free, hypoallergenic and water soluble. It will wash out in the shower in about 10 minutes. The only thing that we use that touches your child is a big Q-tip. And uh, we use that to dip in some, um, some prep, which is like a mild shampoo. And we clean small spots on your child's scalp. Once those spots are clean, we dab on a little mild paste, uh, which conducts electricity and it draws the current from the brain into the wire electrode and then into our recording box. It makes it a really easy, gentle feeling on the head because the little the uh, the little porcelain cup that we use that draws the electricity doesn't even actually touch the skin. It sits inside that conductive paste, and then the paste draws from the brain. Um, once we are done, the kids will leave with a white cotton gauze bandage cap that keeps everything nice and secure. And then for the kids who are not so compliant and fidgety and the parents are concerned that they may try to pull out that tape and remove it, um, that's when we use those little padded helmets like you'll see in that bottom photo. And that's just a lightweight, breathable foam rugby helmet. And we have a, a manufacturer who makes those for us in toddler sizes. 
and we use a little plastic lock to keep that on so the kid can touch it and pull on it, but it's generally not coming off and it brings us great success with the EEG. It makes us able to complete the test more often than not. Um, once you guys are done the, the, the final morning after the EEG is recording, you can remove this in about 10 minutes at home, wash the kid up and business as usual. For those people who are traveling far, we also have shipping crates that we can send you home with so that when you are done with the EEG and you've removed it from your child, you just pack it all up in our shipping crate. We supply a prepaid FedEx label, um, and then you just drop it off at your local FedEx and we get it back in a day or two. It, and then it takes my doctor about 10 days to get you guys a report, which we send to your referring doctor. If your referring doctor thinks that you are now um, needing more care than they're able to deliver, um, we are really good about getting you tertiary level of care referrals. Um, because of our involvement at Epilepsy Awareness Day and the Expo, um, we tend to know every medical director at every top epilepsy program in the country in both peds and adult. And we keep great relationships with these doctors and we are a big referral source. So this is what it looks like on the three stages. Uh, that first little baby is being prepped. You can see that large cotton swab and it's got a little bit of the light blue shampoo solution on there. Um, and she's just gently cleaning spots on the baby's head, each spot the size of about a penny. And um, we need to leave a nice margin of area between the spots so that we don't have any cross currents, um, what we call salt bridging. We don't want the spot on the top of the head to be connected to the spot an inch or two away. So it is a very detailed precision type of installation. Um, a lot of facilities will use any medical personnel who's willing to try to apply the EEG. Um, yes, that's horrible. It's as bad as it sounds, but it's the reality. Um, my tech has been with me for 12 years. I brought her on when she was completing her training program at Concord uh, Neurodiagnostics and um, hired her on as an assistant. And as soon as she figure, finished her certification, we brought her on full time. She's been with me for 12 years and together we have done about 7,000 patients. That middle picture is what it looks like when all the electrodes have been applied. There's a small piece of paper cover tape that keeps everything nice and secure on the scalp. And then once those electrodes are all placed, that third picture is um, an adorable young man who has his full head wrap on. And then all of the cables get tied, the, all of the loose electrode wires, um, they get tied together and stranded into one large cable that comes off the back of the head and it's plugged into that small recorder that I showed you. And that's carried around in that little backpack. Um, and that's basically what the patient looks like when they go home. Not everybody is lucky enough to leave with a seizure detection dog, um, but we didn't send that one home. He actually came with the patient. And yes, that's that was a fun day. Um, so we often get people who travel in and they want to know, can they get both kids or all three kids done at the same time? So yes, we've done three at a time. We've done lots of twins, two sets of triplets, one set of quadruplets. So, um, we are a good source for info. If you go to our website, EEG to go, um, we do have all of our com company info on there. And we have a social story that is a detailed explanation and photo slideshow of the entire EEG process. So we encourage people um, with older kids to view that social story. It takes a lot of the anxiety away from coming to the office for the EEG. Um, and it really um, takes the anxiety away from the parents who are unsure on how this process is gonna is gonna unfold. If you have a child who is uh, has some developmental delays, cognitive impairment, an autism diagnosis, I highly suggest you going to our YouTube channel and viewing that talk below. This talk is posted on several websites and has, I believe, a total of about 60,000 views. Um, 
very world famous and world known Dr. Dan Rosignol, who was one of the leading researchers and treaters of uh, kids with autism. He actually recovers children. Um, I know people don't like to use that term, but when I meet a child who is basically hand flapping, nonverbal, explosive behaviors, and spends multiple times staring off into the light, um, waving fingers in front of their eyes, you know, that's a very impacted patient. And I've seen those patients over the course of a few years develop language, uh, develop sleep. So I suggest watching that talk. Um, Dr. Rosignol speaks on um, why we do EEGs on kids where we can't see seizures or symptoms. And Dr. Millet explains um, what how he, what an EEG unveils and what we how we use it to treat the kids. All right, now on to the fun stuff. Epilepsy Awareness Day at Disneyland. So this will be our 12th year. Um, it's the 11th Epilepsy Expo, but the 12th year of running the event. Um, we had 875 people show up that first year in 2013. And we ended up um, meeting a very knowledgeable physician, Dr. Deborah Holder, who is now the chief at Cedars-Sinai in Los Angeles, and uh, reached back out to Dr. Holder, who said, I'm going to help you and we're going to start an educational expo and we're going to get these people something that is going to that they're going to take home and it's going to make their lives better and we're going to get change uh, the following year we had our first expo we had four doctors give talks um, and a few vendors and about a thousand people showed up and now fast forward to last year 2023 um, we had 200 physicians 80 professional presentations um, which will all be loaded to our YouTube channel. We had 5,200 guests and just a really high energy, super impactful event. Uh, we have a huge focus now on all genetic epilepsies and um, a rare epilepsy arena where we had 30 epilepsy foundation floor. Um, I don't know any other event that's got that, that concentrated element. There really is no other event like this for patients and physicians to mingle with over 5,000 participants. So we're very proud of what we do. It's a full action-packed, education-packed two-day conference, completely free to the families. Um, and we're kind of proud of that. And after that busy two days at the conference where you're working your brain um, until it can't think anymore, gathering up after you know, information on how we can all help our kids. Um, the third day is the warm and fuzzy again. That's the Epilepsy Awareness Day at Disneyland. As you can see from that photo, um, last year was our all-time largest photo. There are 960-something people in that picture. Um, and it's pretty impressive. Disneyland has never seen anything like it. We are the biggest event at the Disneyland Hotel and the biggest event at the park annually. The uh, unfortunately epilepsy awareness day at Disneyland is not free. Disneyland does need to get paid for their tickets, but as it gets closer to the date, we do post a link so that you can purchase tickets with that date reserved um, at a slight discount um, with your new best friend who also has epilepsy and you just met him 40 minutes ago. And now you're coming across your doctor waiting in line for a pretzel. So, um, and of course the doctor is wearing the purple shirt and can't wait to give you a hug or a high five. So it's a beautiful thing to see your doctor actually out there mingling with, with people, you know, like a regular parent. This is the YouTube channel for Epilepsy Awareness Day. Uh, about 10 years ago, we started recording the physician's presentations at Epilepsy Awareness Day Expo. And we have now accumulated almost 600 of those talks. So on any subject epilepsy, if you go to that page and you are to put in any topic on epilepsy, you'll most likely find a talk on that exact topic that you're looking for. There are about 40 genetic epilepsy talks. There's probably not a GABA specific talk there yet, but wait till next year. And in general, it discusses the overall concerns that you need to have as a parent dealing with a child with a genetic epilepsy. So um, I just, you know, 
did place a couple of samples up there that are both amazing. But I would check out both of those talks regardless of, of uh, what your genetic mutation is. They're both very informant. And then the last piece is this. Um, we, uh, Sophie's Journey, which is our nonprofit, we published a book about four years ago. It's 45 stories of epilepsy. There are 40 stories that were written by either the patient or the caregiver about people with epilepsy. And then there are five stories of who we call epilepsy heroes. Way I want you to look at the book and get an understanding of what families go through. There are some stories that will make you smile and laugh. There'll be stories that you relate to. And sadly, there are stories of, you know, of loss. We actually give it away free now in a digital version. And I am going to send a copy to Monica. So anybody who views this talk and would like to get a handle on these epilepsy stories, Monica can then email you that digital copy of our book. And it's free to everybody. We just want to, you know, spread the light and spread the knowledge and hopefully, you know, change somebody's somebody's life. Um, and I think that is my last slide. It is. So I'll leave that up because that's my beautiful daughter on the right, um, who's about to be 15 years seizure free in a couple of weeks, which is pretty unreal. Um, but I'll leave that up there and, and I can field some questions if you guys have. Well, Brad, I just wanted to say that your expo was absolutely amazing. And Kira Gabae made so many connections. Um, we're so excited to be part of it again next year. And, and we'll definitely be celebrating Sophie's Day on February 27th, right alongside you. Um, Thank you. I will put all of your links in the description box below. And with your permission, I would love to uh, put that link of the book on our website. Please so do. that it's easily accessible. Please do. Um, you know, put the free download version. No need to go great. to Amazon. We're not after the money. I'd rather have you have the digital version for free downloads on your site. Great. Thank you so much, Brad. Um, you know, I always, I never really understood the difference between the time frame for the EEGs. There are some EEGs that are very short, um, one hour, 24 hours, 72 hours. So I really appreciate that you explained the importance of the longer EEG as far as what they're giving for the standard of care. And your EEG to go tool is so amazing, such an amazing tool for our community. Um, I mean, Eleanor used it herself and it was seamless. I mean, going into your office was a friendly environment. Um, the entire experience was very different than the one that we had in the hospital. So I can speak from personal experience and I really thank you for that. Thank um, you. I like that and, and I'm glad we, we could help. Yeah, and I also love that you are using that water-soluble so substance between the scalp and the electrode and, mm -hmm. and all of the latex-free, uh, hypoallergenic. I think that was really important for us and I'm sure many other families. We had a lot of questions come in, <laughs> but you answered <laughs> a lot of them. <laughs> um Good. Here's, here's one. Augustina wants to know, how do I get an order for an EEG? Does it matter where I'm located? You met, you mentioned sending patients home with a shipping crate. How does it work logistically if I'm out of the state or even the country? Do I pay something in addition oh to the shipping? I should have emphasized, I mean, where our offices are, generally our patients are drawn, you know, an hour to two hours away Um from those offices. But again, I know what it is to be in desperation mode when it's your child. And when you're seeing your child have symptoms that appear to be seizure, but every time you take that child to the ER or to go see your neurologist or primary care, they're having the best day of their life and they're not seeing, the doctor's not seeing any of the seizure activity. So at that point, it's not the worst thing in the world to maybe travel a bit to go and, you know, and get that EEG done. Um, but the traveling and the shipping thing is generally, 
um, you know, a few hours away. Although in our Southern California office, we have a huge clientele that travels down from the Bay Area. So that's technically how that works. Um, if the logistics and the location are not an issue, how do you get an order? Um, so we do encourage people to go to primary care, ask the pediatrician, let them know what you're seeing, let them know that you think there are symptoms. Um, and so all I need is an order from any doctor, any treating physician, um, and then we can get that EEG done and insurance will generally cover that. Great. That was actually another question. Do you take insurance? But I wanted to mention that CureGaba A has created a recommended doctors list. And um, I'll include the link in the description box so we don't have to do this song and dance with physicians anymore. Um, another question that came in is, how often do you suggest that we do EEGs? Well, so, okay. Um, on a brand new patient, we get them as needed, right? So you think you saw some symptoms, the neurologist isn't concerned. He ran a 20 or 40 minute EEG. He found nothing, which is normal. Um, and then decided that there wasn't any further EEG needed. Now you've gone to your pediatrician and you've convinced them to get you that EEG. Now we're running the first ever overnight EEG. And of course, you know, at 2.07 a.m. in the middle of the night, when you would never be sitting in a hospital having a 40 minute EEG, that's when our doctor finds these, you know, small bursts of activity in between, you know, N2 and N3, or as you're, the child's approaching REM sleep, he's finding these little bursts of seizure activity. Um, and we wouldn't see that. We won't see it because the kid is sleeping and so is mom and dad. So those would never be detected. Now you've got your order, you're coming in, you're getting this overnight EEG, and we've got this, you know, all telling, revealing report that says, well, both nights of the 48 hour EEG, we found burst during sleep around 1 to 2 a.m. Um, we're going to start the treatment plan now. So now that the child is on medication, that doctor would most likely recommend a follow up EEG in one year. He's going to want to take his time with your titration schedule, make sure that the child looks and appears to have less symptoms, be improving cognitively, sleeping better, um, you know, and at that therapeutic dose. Then he would want to check the efficacy and see what the actual EEG looks like. So you're looking at it about a year. Um, and then if anybody is thinking of coming off of medications, good doctors will tend to do an EEG to just make sure that the brain is nice and clean before removing the seizure meds. Um, otherwise we have catastrophe. And, um, and on the more complicated cases where doctors are really chasing the data and they're trying things like off-label medications or, um, you know, new, new techniques or, or different doses that may be above and beyond what most guidelines would stipulate, they're going to do more frequent EEG so that they don't miss anything, um, you know, in, in, in the time lapse. So at that point, we would probably see people, you know, every six months. Then again, we do get the occasional uh, doctor who is, you know, boom, the light bulb just really screwed in tight and went on full blast. And he's got an idea and he may have seen an EEG a month and a half ago on a patient, but it was a 24 hour and it had very few spikes, but there was some abnormality. And he wants to know, he thinks he's got that kid figured out. He started a diet, he started a med, and he's sure it's going to make an immediate, uh, immediate um, change on that child. So two months in, he may do another EEG already just to see that he is on the right track. And if he sees the little bit of improvement that he suspected, um, then I won't see that patient for a long time. And uh, Federico wants to know, after they do the EEG to go, how do they get the tracings? Are you providing a report like we get from the hospital or the entire tracing? They can have both. So we do furnish a very comprehensive report. Every abnormal report that we print 
um, our doctor will put uh, screenshots of the abnormalities from the EEG into that EEG report so that you actually have something finite and physical to look at. It's definitive. Um, that's the first thing. If the doctor who referred you would like to read the raw EEG, that's not a problem at all. We email that doctor a link to our um, HIPAA compliant and proprietary reading cloud, which we own. And um, that cloud hosts Persist, which is the, you know, the it's the go-to um, gold standard of, of reading softwares. Um, and they can view that EEG on our cloud um, with that seizure and spike detection, um, seizure software, reading software, um, and they have access to your entire EEG. We never prune or clip the data. We save every minute of every EEG. So I've now, you know, we've amassed um, over 100 terabytes of EEG data over the past 12 years. Uh, by not pruning or clipping anyone's EEG so that if we were going to do a retroactive study on a 13-year-old who has Dravet syndrome with a diagnosis since he's one, I have every single minute of EEG data from the day we met that one-year-old until his 13th you know, year of, of coming for EEGs. Like I said, you know, without having any changing variables, we've had the same doctor read all the studies, the same technologist do all the hookups, the same equipment, the procedure, everything is the same. The only variable in this child's, you know, path is the treatments. So it's really easy to look at that comprehensive, you know, timeline of data and figure out what was working and what wasn't working on the treatments. I did want to say that I think the question is stemming from the fact that we are compiling our EEG tracings. So Cure Gaba A is getting their community organized, and we are sending our EEG tracings to Dr. Reiki Moller in Denmark. And they have uh, started a study where they are looking for biomarkers within these EEGs for Gaba A variant mutation patients. And also, a uh, combined brain will also be creating a EEG uh, repository. So I think that's where that question came from. And it's wonderful that we will have access to the entire EEG tracings. Um, yeah, what I wanted you to just also... told me is a little saddening, and I'll tell you why. Tell me why. Do you know how many people are going to have seven minutes of EEG data because their doctor did a 60 minute? He clipped out what he thought was relevant and they deleted the rest. And right. that seven minutes, it's so sad that that's what that patient has to supply when someone like yourself is going to give them 71 hours and 20 minutes with video. And that's what they should have. So as people are starting to collect that those EEGs, I would be really aggressively forcing the hand of their doctor to get them a minimum of 24 hours of recording. And I think after hearing your presentation here today, they will absolutely be inspired to do that. Good. Um, I, I also wanted to sincerely thank you for all the introductions that you've made for those GABA-A specialists uh, that are included in your attendees list at EAD. And I know that you always have us, Cure Gaba A, in mind as you speak to specialists in the field. So I'm so grateful for that, Brad. Um, of I laughed through your entire presentation. You made an unfortunate test uh, that as parents have to take for our kids and made it so lighthearted. And this presentation is definitely going to be easy to watch. I just want to reiterate that all of your links will be in the description box below. I am so grateful to have met you. So grateful that you are part of our community, the tools that you have provided for us. And I look forward to a long standing relationship with you. Yeah, I see I'm the just... same. I'm really happy <laughs> that we got to meet you. And I think that, uh, you know, it's, we we love to see the parents get involved and take action because nobody 
is going to try to save your child except you. And then when we have the parents who try to take action, but they don't bottleneck it in their home, they're trying to take action with the mission that not only are they trying to save their child, but they're willing to take everybody else's child along for the ride as well. Just jump on the train. And, and I know you are one of those parents. And so we are very fortunate to have met you. Um, we're really happy to have, you know, Cure Gaba A as a, as a um, participant in the, in the rare epilepsy arena. And um, I think that a lot of your followers are very lucky because I know you're after the answers. And I also know you don't sleep. And I also know you're not quitting until you get your answers for your daughter. So everybody who's on your bandwagon is going to reap the benefit of your, you know, ferocity and and passion as well. So uh, if the leader of the foundation did not have that portfolio, I most likely wouldn't have them on the expo floor. So um, I'm glad you're doing what you're doing and I, be proud of it. My heart is so full after what you just said. I am so happy. Thank you, Brad. We'll talk soon. Of course. Thanks for the yes, presentation. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Bye. Email me with any questions. I'm happy to help. Will do. Bye. Thank you.